was born in Scotland um, in 79 years ago, and um, I studied at the London School of Economics, and I've been teaching at Oxford University now for over 40 years. Actually, I'm officially retired from teaching, but still, as you can see, writing and researching. Um, I've um, spent quite a bit of time in other countries um, giving visiting lectures, and I've been a visiting professor several times in the United States, at Yale, at Columbia, and University of Texas at Austin. I've also spent a lot of time in Russia. I've been to South Korea twice. Um, I was invited by Kim Dae-jung before he became president, um, a conference held by the Kim Dae-jung Foundation. And uh, then I went back to Seoul for a conference of the International Political Science Association. I've also been twice to China, twice to Japan for <coughs> conferences and lectures. Um, so I've had some experience of Asia, but um, mainly I've lectured in European countries and in the United States. Well, I think that um, the term strong leader is used as if it were a synonym for good leader. Um, well, if strong leader simply means good leader, we can all be in favour because we'd all prefer a good leader to a bad leader, um, or, and we'd prefer an effective leader to an ineffective leader. But for the idea of strong leader to be meaningful, I think it has to be defined as somebody who maximises the power in their own hands, somebody who wants to take all the big decisions. And I argue that that's undesirable. It's um, not the most efficient way of conducting government, nor is it the most democratic. And um, on the whole, more collective leaderships are more successful than leaderships which concentrate vast power in one person's hands. Now, there is, of course, a difference between a strong leader in an authoritarian regime and a strong leader in a democracy. A strong leader in an authoritarian regime has got no checks on his power. Um, a Stalin, a Hitler, a Mao Zedong. Um, so a strong leader in a democracy doesn't have that kind of power, but they can still have too much. And no leader was ever chosen because that person was believed to have a monopoly of wisdom. And a leadership in which power and authority is more dispersed tends to produce better government, and certainly more democratic government. <clears throat> well, I include a category of totalitarian and authoritarian leadership, uh, as I've just mentioned, um, that's especially dangerous. Um, and a collective leadership in such a, an authoritarian regime is a lesser evil compared with concentrating power in one person's hands. So if we take the case of China, China under Mao Zedong was responsible for hundreds of millions, sorry, well, tens of millions, possibly hundreds of millions of unnecessary deaths. Um, Terrible decisions like the Cultural Revolution and even worse, the Great Leap Forward, which killed far more people in the, the countryside. Um, compare that with post-Mao China, in which China's made great economic progress. And uh, under Deng Xiaoping, of course, it became a, a market economy and a more tolerant place, authoritarian still, but more tolerant than it was in the days of Mao. So that's just one example of how, even in an authoritarian regime, a collective leadership, more collective leadership, is a lesser evil than um, personalistic rule. Um, I have a chapter on revolutionary leaders, and I define the revolutionary leader as somebody who uses violence in order to secure power. And a regime which is born in violence um, tends to be less democratic than one which has reached a new system by a process of peaceful evolution. Um, so all the communist revolutions um, finished up by replacing one kind of authoritarian regime by another. Now I've got a cat two categories of redefining leaderships and transformational leaderships. Tra for transformational, I set the bar very high. I mean a leader who produces systemic change. 
uh, whether the political system or the economic system. And I give five examples, people who really could be called transformational leaders. Charles de Gaulle in France, uh, France moved from what was called the Fourth Republic to the Fifth Republic. It became a different kind of democratic system and a more stable one, a more effective one than the Fourth Republic. Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, he oversaw a complete transformation of the Soviet political system. Uh, of course, um, there were unintended consequences, including the breakup of the Soviet Union, but nevertheless, he left Russia a freer country than it had ever been at the time he left office. Um, <clears throat> a very important example, who is, uh, and it's often overlooked, was that of um, Adolfo Suarez in Spain. Suarez came from a conservative background. He'd been an official in the Franco regime. Uh, but when he became prime minister, he began a process of including everyone. He included even the communists, the socialists, and uh, not least important, he brought together the different regions and nations. He brought in the Basques and uh, the Catalans uh, so that they became part of the new political and constitutional process. So he really was a very collegial leader, very inclusive, very patient, he negotiated, and Spain has been regarded as one of the most successful transitions from authoritarian rule to democracy. Now in Spain today there is a constitutional crisis, and that's partly because the leadership in Madrid has not shown the same flexibility um, and uh, political adroitness that was displayed by Suarez. <clears throat> I think under Suarez, there would not have been, they would not have reached this crisis point. Um, a problem has been turned into a crisis through insufficient uh, political flexibility. Another example I give is that of Deng Xiaoping. Now, China remained highly authoritarian politically, but nevertheless, there was a transformation of the economic system. So that today, over two-thirds of industrial output in China comes from the private sector. And China, is a, the state still has a very important role, but still it's essentially a market economy. So that was absolutely unthinkable in Mao's time. Tremendous transformation. And the other example, the last of my five examples, is that of Nelson Mandela. Many people assumed that when South Africa eventually um, ceased to have an apartheid racist regime, there would be tremendous bloodshed. Um, uh, it would end in great violence between whites and blacks. And it didn't because Mandela was such a wise and collegial uh, leader and showed an almost superhuman magnanimity after so many years in prison that he brought, that he <clears throat> brought about um, a new understanding between people of different ethnic groups in South Africa. Now, South Africa has got many problems today, um, and leadership after Mandela has not been as wise and far-seeing as Mandela was. But Mandela played a crucial part in the democratization of South Africa, moving from minority rule to majority rule and to a new tolerance. So those are... <clears throat> Remarkable leaders, but I've got a category of redefining leadership, which is also quite important. Um, this means redefining the limits of the possible within any particular country. It doesn't mean total transformation of the system, like a transformational leader, but very significant change. And this need not be leadership of one person. It can be by a government. If I take two British examples, um, <clears throat> The two governments since the Second World War that have made the biggest difference in this country were the immediate post-war Labour government headed by Clement Attlee from 1945 to 1951 and the Conservative government headed by Margaret Thatcher from 1979 to 1990. And these were completely different in their styles of rule, not only in policy, but under this Labour government, the modern welfare state was created in Britain. A lot of public ownership was introduced, and it was a very radical departure from previous policy. But it was a very a, a leadership in which power was dispersed. Attlee didn't take all the big decisions. Even in foreign policy, the foreign minister, Ernest Bevan, 
was a more powerful policymaker than the Prime Minister Attlee. The Thatcher government is very different. Mrs Thatcher wanted to take all the big decisions herself and it was a government which changed a great deal. It reversed many of the things that had remained in place ever since that Labour government had put them there and privatisation of public services and so on um, and a, a deregulation of financial services. Some of the consequences of that are still being felt. Um, so Thatcher was very important. She was a very capable leader and as many people have said she was a conviction politician but one of her convictions was that she was always right and that conviction in the end led to her downfall because a majority of her own Conservative cabinet decided that enough was enough and she was replaced as leader in 1990 very much against her will. Well the interesting thing is that two of the really big movements of the 20th century were communism and fascism and as far as their ideology was concerned of course it was very different and in their ideology the attitude to the leader was very different but some of the practice became not so very different so under fascism the leader was all important um, Hitler took the view that the leader was the leader was the movement. The leader was more important than the movement. And um, I mean, the very term Führer Prinzip, um, leader principle, was a fundamental part of Nazi doctrine. And so Hitler wielded dictatorial rule, and there was a huge cult of Hitler's personality. Now, in the case of the Soviet Union, leaders were supposedly not so very important. Um, this was um, a class movement and inevitably the working class would come to power. In reality a small group of revolutionaries seized power in Russia in November 1917 and um, certainly there was a class politics pursued and um, many people of bourgeois origin were persecuted um, but many of the leaders actually were of um, middle class origin like um, Lenin himself. So Lenin discouraged um, a leader cult, even though he did wield a great deal of power. But of course under Stalin, uh, the leader cult in the Soviet Union became just as great as Hitler's. People, um, if they even um, hinted at criticism of Stalin, they found themselves um, arrested in a labor camp. And Stalin had such personal power that he was able to um, have executed even members of the leadership team members of the Central Committee, even members of the polit ruling Politburo. So what began as ideologies that were utterly different in the 20th century led in many communist countries to a cult of a leader which was not so different from fascism. Not in every communist country. In Hungary, for example, Janos Kadar, who for many years was the leading politician there, he had rather a modest personal lifestyle. Um, so there were some differences. Whereas fascism, you couldn't imagine it without an all-powerful leader and a leader cult. In communism, it was possible without it. Um, but in the major communist countries, including the Soviet Union and China, uh, there were long periods of leader cults. And a leader cult is, of course, very dangerous. And you've seen it in North Korea under the succession of Kim's. We should not put too much emphasis on the leader, you know, one individual. Because if you look around the world, some of the most successful democracies have been in Scandinavia, countries like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, which have avoided setting up one leader on a pedestal. These are usually coalition governments, and they're governments which um, have produced more equal societies and more prosperous societies than virtually any others on else. Um, or post-war Germany. Um, post-war Germany has avoided leader cults, but it's been a great success story. It's been political success and economic success. And something like Angela Merkel today, one of the most impressive of contemporary leaders, and she has quite a low-key low style. She's not a charismatic leader, doesn't pretend to be, but she's a good listener, a very effective leader, 
Um, and um, it's more important to be an effective leader than a strong leader.